Welcome to the Unisoft question. I am Pulat Unisoft, your host. I interview lawyers and judges. The show is supported by my law practice, Unisoft Law Professional Corporation. I am a commercial litigator. I've done nothing but litigation since 2011. Many of you know me or my work. I would really appreciate your referrals. They are safe with me. Thank you and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Unisoft question. And this is another judicial episode of the Unisoft question. This is the most uh, special judicial episode today. Uh, I'm honored to have Associate Chief Justice of Ontario, Mikhail Fairburn, with me. Welcome to the show. Hello, Pulat. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. Uh, you know, I want, because this is such a special episode, I want to start this episode in a way that I've never started an episode before. I want to show a photograph and then I want to let you explain what the photograph is. So this is the first time I'm doing this. I'm sharing the screen on Zoom and uh, hopefully everyone uh, can see this photograph. Can you see the photo? <laughs> I, I can see the photo, yes. Yes, so I assume that our audience will see the photo too uh, once I posted this. So. I see two young women here uh, running on a track. I love running myself. I was a sprinter when I was in high school. And can you tell me who these women are? Well, I can tell you who the one is um, on on my my right as I look at the screen. <laughs> well, the one that has the it, it, it 1276, might... right? Yeah, 1276. I, I definitely know that person. That's a, a, a very young version of me. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> I I believe it is 1979. I obtained this oh, photo okay. yeah. from the Toronto Star archives, and uh, the uh, caption refers to you as Michelle Fairburn. That's not unusual. I've uh, been <laughs> called Michelle, Michael, all kinds of things my my whole life. So yeah, that's very and, possible. And according to the caption, you are the first uh, prize winner here because as Everybody can see your right foot has crossed the finish line. And uh, I, I believe the woman's name on the left is Brenda. Brenda's uh, foot hasn't yet crossed the finish line. So you won. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So if every, anybody wants to search the Toronto Star uh, archives, they can find this photo. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, I've never started uh, the show uh, this way. So you're, this is the first time. Well, that's good I, reason. On your part, Pulat, <laughs> I must say. Thank you, thank you. I I do my job. Well, I'm really curious. So, do you still run? I do. I'm still a runner. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a much slower runner now, but I'm still running. Yes. How did you get into running? Was it your parents that got you into running, or was it yourself, or a coach, or your friend? Uh, it, it was actually our parents got us all into running, my sisters and uh, and me as well. My parents were runners. My, my father in particular was a big runner, and uh, they thought it was a fun family activity to do together. We actually had a family uniform and used to go to races together as a family. <laughs> I haven't thought about that in a long time, but... Yeah, so we would run together. I was raised in, in the country, um, and... Uh, we had lots of side roads to to run on so we we did a lot of that yeah <laughs> according to the toronto star archive and apparently toronto star was really interested in you when you were growing up so maybe they know something <laughs> but uh, according to the toronto star archive you were grew up in brock ontario i, I think brock is part of durham uh, uh durham right. region I grew up in, in Brock Township. I, I was born in Toronto, uh, as were my sisters. Uh, but we moved up up north. My father uh, got a principalship. He, he was uh, a teacher prior to that and then a vice principal. And then when he got a principalship, it, it was in Brock Township. So the whole family got moved out of what where we, where we were living at that time, which was Scarborough. Yeah. Could you talk a little about your mother? Sure. Um, my mother's uh, first name is Sheila. She's incredible. She's uh, uh, comes from uh, a family of uh, 
uh, a very interesting past, actually, um, but a family that raised racehorses, actually. And uh, so uh, on Lake Ontario in the Pickering area, um, close to what is now, or in fact, the farm, the, the old uh, homestead would be on what is uh, now the, the Petticoat Creek. Uh, it's a conservation area out on Lake Ontario in the Pickering area. And so that's my mom's, uh, my mom's background and where she was raised. And where she really developed a love, I think, of the country and of, of animals. Um, my mom is a, a tender, amazing human being. She loves nature. Um, she loves family. She, she loves people. She's vivacious. She's incredibly active. Uh, in her 80s, we sometimes have trouble getting her on the phone because she's out doing her workout, as she puts it. <laughs> Uh, tell me, whose idea was it to name you Mikal and why? Well, it's actually my middle name, um, but it's the only name that I have ever been called. Um, my my first name is is actually, if you look at my passport, Jesse, and often you'll see in my official capacity there's a there's an initial <laughs> at the front end of my name, and the J stands for Jesse, um, and 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 Jesse you know, the is actually my grandmother, my my father's mother, who um, was born um, at home on the on, in a homestead um, in northern Ontario uh, to a number of midwives who assisted. Jesse, Annie, Francis, Rowena were the midwives who attended that birth, um, and so that is where the name Jesse comes from. Um, and uh, then the middle name, which my parents always called me by, um, Mikkel is actually a name my father came across when I was when I was born, um, or actually as I was expected. Uh, and uh, they already had two girls in pretty close succession, and I was coming in pretty close succession after number two. Um, so if I was going to be a boy, I, I was going to be like everyone else, only they only ever got girls. Um, I was going to be Andrew, but Andrew never arrived. So my dad actually came up with this name. He, he was um, pursuing a, another degree at, at uh, Queen's University. And frankly, he just came across this name. Didn't I don't even know that he really knew the origin of the name. And he came home and he said to my mom, you know, if it's a if it's another girl that sounds like a really neat name, what do you think? And so I became Jesse Michel. Yeah. That's wonderful. Uh, I'm I know that you went to UFT for your undergrad. I know that you went to UFT for law school. I, I can't imagine what you, I, I can probably imagine what you did in law school. Can you tell us more about what you did in your undergrad, what your major was, how you decided to go into law? Tell us all about it. Uh, well, I you're right. I went to University of Toronto for my undergrad and I really went there because, again, it you know comes back to kind of the I'm number three of four girls. My other sisters had already uh, well, they were actually in uni the University of Toronto at the time that I arrived there. So we there were three of us at the same time. And I just thought, well, my sisters are there. That's, that's where I'll go. Um, and number two sister, Robin, uh, she was at Victoria College at U of T and that looked fun. So that's where I ended up. Uh, and uh, my number one sister, the first, the first one, Jane, she was at, uh, at St. Michael's College. And, and so we were all very close together geographically during the, those years. And um, anyway, it was it was great. It was it was a fabulous uh, degree. I did it in um, largely history and political science, um, and I really enjoyed it. I actually started in in, in economics, um, but I very quickly realized that wasn't my calling. And so I I switched over, and uh, yeah, it was just like frankly uh, years of just you know satiating kind of a desire to to learn about all manner of all manner of things and uh really just explore a bit in terms of what my interests were i ran for the varsity um cross country club during uh, my undergrad and so i i had kind of a vested interest in in staying at u of t um 
plus there was some other reasons like personal you know relationships and things of that nature I, I wanted to stay at U of T so I I uh, was very fortunate um, when I kind of thought, what do I want to do? Ultimately, I settled on, I came from a family of educators, really. Jesse Fairburn was a, a teacher. Um, my aunts and uncles, uh, I had an aunt and uncle Fairburn, you know, uh, from the Fairburn family who were teachers as well. My father, my mother was in education, everybody. Uh, so, and I had a a sister already pursuing education. So it was going to be teaching or law. I think that's actually the experience of a lot of lawyers, but I ultimately settled on, no, I want to do law. So um, yeah, I was lucky. I got into U of T law school I, I, and it was a fantastic uh, experience. Mm -hmm. I will definitely talk uh, to you more about your career path, but I want to jump ahead and I want to talk about your current role. And I want to talk about your current office and I want to talk about your current place of work. You are Associate Chief Justice of Ontario. Can you tell more about this role, the functions, why this role exists? What are the special responsibilities? Uh, please share. Okay, um, sure. So I'm actually literally physically in my office right now at Osgoode Hall. Um, and uh, what's the function of the Associate Chief Justice's office? It's it's somewhat interesting uh, in the following sense, and I don't think a lot of people uh, know this, but Ontario is actually the only uh, province that and, and territory that has an Associate Chief Justice of the uh, the province. Um, and that's probably owing to just to our size and our population and so on, but it, it's a bit of an aberration. There are, of course, associate chief justices all through the country, um, and uh, they they sit uh, on, when they're on superior courts on the Canadian Judicial Council, along with the chief justices throughout the country. Uh, but Ontario is the only one that has an associate chief justice of the whole province. So um, both the chief justice of Ontario and the Associate Chief Justice of Ontario sit on the Court of Appeal for Ontario. Uh, and then, of course, there is the Chief Justice uh, and Associate Chief Justice of the Superior Court of Justice, who are uh, also housed in Osgoode of Hall, their offices, Chief Justice uh, Morowitz and uh, Associate Chief Justice uh, Faye McWatt. Uh, so what does the Associate Chief Justice do? Uh, I would say it's largely um, an undefined role, <laughs> and you kind of work it out with the Chief Justice. So over the last few years, while I've held this position, until very recently, the last few months, uh, I held the position while working very closely with um, Chief Justice George Strathy, which was just an incredible privilege and and honor. We were able to work together and collaborate, um, frankly, through most of the pandemic together. Um, prior to me holding this office, uh, the the incredible Associate Chief Justice Alexandra Hoy held the office, and uh, she did that collaboration with with Chief Justice uh, Strathy. So. Um, you know, I think by convention, I would say the one thing that definitely falls to the Associate Chief Justice's office here would be scheduling matters uh, in the Court of Appeal. Um, but there are there are other things, and it depends on that relationship and the give and the take and the kind of you do this, uh, I'll do that kind of thing. I would say that for the most part, the Chief Justice's role is more outward looking historically. The associate chief justice's role tends to be more inward looking to the, the court of appeal. So um, we're, we are also, uh, by virtue of legislation, administrators in the province. So when the lieutenant governor general uh, can't uh, for, you know, if, if, if she's traveling, if she's outside the province, can't perform her duties, then it falls in a certain line. Uh, to perform those duties on on behalf of the uh, Lieutenant Governor General and and falling in that line, of course, is also uh, the Chief Justice of the Superior Court and the Associate Chief Justice of the Superior Court. And once once you get down that line, it falls to uh, senior judges on the, the Court of Appeal. 
You mentioned scheduling as part of your responsibilities. I've always been curious how cases are assigned to panels at the Court of Appeal. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. We, we are a generalist court. Um, everybody on this court sits on all manner of appeals. Um, slightly over in the last few years, 50% of our work is criminal. And historically, it hovers around that. So about 50% of the Court of Appeals work is criminal, I would say. And then 50% is everything else. Um, but everybody on this court sits on everything and hears all manner of, of cases that come before the court. So we uh, what we tend to do is look at constituting our panels in a way that has an eye to uh, balance and uh, balance in, in all respects um, and panels that can hear any type of work that comes. The cases tend to be slotted in after the fact, actually. Uh, and uh, but we are absolutely confident that all the judges on this court can hear all manner of cases and do do that and decide all manner of cases. So we have an extraordinary appeal scheduling unit uh, where the cases come in and time, time, times are being looked for, dates are being looked for, and that is all done uh, administratively through the extraordinary work of uh, the, the people who work in that in that unit as they're picking the dates and, uh, and slotting appeals in. We're in pretty good shape right now. Um, you know, uh, even post pandemic, we're um, we're slotting appeals in even right right now that are we can find dates for the most part. I mean, there's there's exceptions to the rule, but you can find dates in this court uh, not too many months out uh, if it's a, a what I'd call like an average uh, length of appeal. So that's that's the work of that unit and uh, and the people that work within it to to find the right dates and the right panels to put it before. How far ahead are you are in clearing the pandemic backlog, or are you done with that now? So um, I always hesitate a bit to to talk about this because our our court faced a lot of challenges during the pandemic. Um, we probably faced though uh, as an appellate court, less challenges than the trial courts. Um, and I should take the word probably out of that. I'm With certainty, we face less challenges than trial courts. <clears throat> when we had to change to online, I think it's, it's true that appellate work is uh, uniquely conducive to, uh, to, to actually doing it online and doing it in an electronic format. We are not hearing witnesses except in very exceptional cases uh, involving fresh evidence. We don't uh, have people you know, in and out and too many moving parts. We're dealing with a set record for the most part, as you know, Pulat. So I, we have um, the kind of court where uh, it's not built for a pandemic, Nothing's been for a pandemic, but certainly when we had to confront that in March of 2020, uh, we were able to get up and running pretty quickly and continue with our caseload. So to answer your question, uh, we actually are not in a backlog situation here. We are pushing um, right now about the same number of judgments this year, hovering around the same number as we would historically be hovering around at this stage of the year. We've managed to clear the same uh, number of appeals and uh, we're, we're in pretty good shape, I'd say. Can you talk about another uh, sort of inside topic how five judge panels are constituted i've tried once to request a five judge panel i mean i've tried many things in my practice and i, I failed i didn't get it but i'm really curious how that works i know the practice directions but are there any sort of unspoken rules or principles uh, that counsel should be aware of i hope i didn't say no to you Pulat. <laughs> no uh no no you were not on the panel 
I believe okay. I believe you're not on the panel. Okay, I'm 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 only kidding. But I often those requests come through my office. They're either going to come through the Chief Justice's office or my office when you request a five judge panel. Um, it's the same thing with interventions for for the most part. It will go to the Chief Justice or the Associate Chief Justice from time to time. They are put into um, before a judge in a, a motions court as well. But the five judge panels. Um, I see a lot of those requests. And uh, there are a number of considerations that go into it. I think you start with the presumption that we sit as three, uh, and there has to be a good reason to sit five. So the reasons tend to be rooted in uh, considerations like, uh, is this appeal going to potentially uh raise uh, considerations as to whether our court's jurisprudence is wrong or needs reconsideration um if that's the case you do not want three judges deciding whether another three judges uh got potentially uh something wrong or that the law should just evolve from the, from there you probably want to have five judges looking at that so that would be one situation um another situation would be where we uh, are looking at something that's of significant public attention, like the greenhouse gas reference would be a very good example of where we sat five judges on, on the appeal. Uh, and there's a there's a reason for that. It's, it involves the constitutional issues at play, but it also involves the the, the public interest uh, considerations that are are so uh, significant and and sometimes those kinds of appeals will actually even prior to the pandemic like the greenhouse uh gas reference case so like we we'd actually publicize uh that and allow cameras into the courtroom so it will often dovetail with something of that nature but it's it's very rare well i wasn't lucky <laughs> um I know that a lot of, and you know, I'm sure that a lot of appellate lawyers are watching this or listening this right now. You, of course, come across a great number of appellate lawyers. I know that in the United States, they have the appellate bar. They have lawyers who do nothing but appeals, and then they have lawyers who do nothing but trials. Do you think we have an appellate bar in Ontario, do you think, can you think of lawyers, and you don't have to name names, but can you think of a group of lawyers and 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 say, well, they do nothing but appeals. They, I know that they are appellate lawyers and nothing else. There are definitely lawyers who primarily do appeals. You see that um, primarily on the criminal side, I would say, much mm -hmm. more frequent than uh, than elsewhere at the bar. And uh, remember on the criminal side, uh, one side of that courtroom is going to be a Crown Council, whether it's the Public Prosecution Service of Canada or uh, what we, we call in this court, the Crown, Crown Law Office criminal, because it's going to be an indictable criminal appeal as opposed to a summary conviction appeal, which would happen in the Superior Court. Uh, the, the Crowns are going to come from a, a very small pool of, of Crown Counsel. Uh, because um, just I'll, I'll just speak about cr criminal code indictable offenses. Uh, the Crown Law Office criminal at 720 Bay Street, um, which is actually the office where I started my career and spent a couple of decades, uh, is the office that is, is the singular office that furnishes the counsel that come to this court. Uh, it's not like if you are a uh, trial crown prosecuting uh, in Northern Ontario, let's say Kenora, you would follow your case on appeal to the Court of Appeal. There would be a pass off within the prosecution service to a Crown Counsel and the Crown Law Office Colonel. So the, um, and I think it's equally true of the defense bar. You, you tend to see a certain element of the defense bar uh, in, in criminal law who are here a whole lot. I'm not saying that they never do trials. Uh, they probably do. And even the crowns out of the Crown Law Office criminal are going to you know, have trial experience as well and do that uh, from time to time. And indeed, there's a pocket of crowns in that office who do trials. Uh, but 
Um, I would say that it's a much smaller bar that comes here. We see there's frequent flyers, if I can put it that way. I think there's some frequent flyers on the non-criminal side as well, coming from the civil bar, but it's I don't think it's as obvious as as on the criminal side. I can't help thinking about uh, the late Justice Rosenberg, uh, who before his appointment was, I think he was a primarily uh, appellate lawyer, at least uh, that's what I learned from uh, Marie Hannon's biography that I read recently. Do you think this is a fair statement? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. My uh, my first uh, or one of my very first appeals uh, was actually when I was here as Crown Counsel and very afraid and I just couldn't believe that I, I was here and literally my first month probably or a couple of months of practice was uh was was with the the later to become the honorable mark rosenberg uh and he was absolutely legendary uh for his appellate practice and and had a very nice symmetry going of course with eddie greenspan um doing the the, the trials side uh, so, and, and uh, I, if I could just say, I mean, he would, Mark Rosenberg was incredible. Um, I learned so much from him and he was so kind to young counsel. He was an incredible mentor, even when he was on the opposite side of the courtroom, he'd really lend a hand. Uh, he was very encouraging and, uh, and later, you know, not too many late, years later, after I got to know him as counsel, uh, he was appointed to this court, of course, as a as a judge, and what a pleasure to appear before. And by the way, I've read uh, Marie's biography uh, as well. What what a what a great uh, piece of work! I love the I love that. So book. interesting. Nothing but the truth. It's called. Yeah. Well, hopefully one day I will interview Marie Hannon. Um, speaking uh, of speaking of. <laughs> have to like give her a call and, and see yeah. if she'll do it i hope she's listening to this <laughs> <laughs> um speaking of uh, the beginners as you were when you faced mark rosenberg in uh, your first or second month of practice and uh of uh, also speaking of elite lawyers like mark rosenberg at the height of his career of course you hear appeals where on the one side Sometimes you have a top litigator, a top appellate lawyer, and on the other side, you have, no, if not a beginner, then an average or an unknown lawyer. I would really struggle with um, bias, with with uh, cognitive bias, with all the all the things that I know about this elite lawyer, and it would be really hard for me. But well, I'm not a judge. So what is your experience like uh, in, in that situation? What, what, what would be hard for you? It would be really hard for me to overcome this idea that this is an, a, a top litigator. He's done this a thousand times and he is so good. Everybody knows he is good. Well, and this lawyer, for example, Pulat, <laughs> nobody's heard about him before. So maybe he is not so good all of these things will go through my subconscious i will not i will try to keep them there in the subconscious but we all know how the subconscious affects us how it creates biases oh, so I, hmm. I want oh. i want to prevent uh, biases from happening when i am appointed i pointed to the bench no i'm joking <laughs> yeah no i look uh Pulat, i i uh I've never thought about it that way. I mean, I'm you're you're opening my 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 eyes on the, that a little bit. I I I have to say, um, I might if I'm walking into the courtroom and I know there's a lawyer who I've seen a lot um, and I know is an excellent lawyer. You know, you're going to have a great day of advocacy. But the best of advocates uh, aren't. It doesn't mean they're advancing the right position. <laughs> doesn't mean they're advancing the winning position or it doesn't mean that they're going to be right in the end result uh, i mean there's a you can't conflate uh good advocacy with what ultimately or how ultimately the case should be uh decided and i think in this court uh we really value all forms of advocacy and one thing that we really value here and i i think our money is where our mouth is is actually new advocates getting on their feet in this court 
um, we see it as a, as a very important piece uh, feeding the, the health of the administration of justice, that all lawyers are brought along so that they can achieve a level of confidence, so that they can build their advocacy skills, so they can become that a uh, great advocate one day. And in fact, I when I say we put our money where our mouth is, uh, we, uh, uh, Chief Justice Strathy and, and, and I put out not too long ago, probably I've lost a bit track of time. I find that happens with, with uh, the pandemic, but during the pandemic, probably in the last 18 months or so, I'm gonna go with that. Uh, we put out a joint statement uh, that encourages senior counsel to allow junior counsel to get on their feet in our court and to actually make submissions. And, and there's a reason for that. We, we really not only value that, and let's face it, it's the junior counsel who often put a lot of heavy lifting into the preparation of that appeal. Um, but we really value um, the, the nurturing of counsel in this court and bringing them along. And I think that's really in the, the highest traditions of this court, but also of the profession. You you don't become a great lawyer uh, just by watching. You become a great lawyer by watching and by doing and doing and doing and, and learning by doing. And so, uh, you know, everybody understands that process. So to come back to your original question, I don't think there is any bias. I, 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 I value everybody's submissions. I'm just looking for what's right in every single case. And that might be the position that's being advanced by the lawyer who's six months out up against a giant on the other side of the courtroom. Before you were appointed to the Court of Appeal, uh, you, you were a trial judge in Brampton. By the way, another guest of the show, uh, Justice Ranjan Agarwal, is uh, also a trial judge in Brampton. So I just I like making these references to other guests of the show during my interviews. Can you talk about how trial judges are elevated to the Court of Appeal? What's it like? Let's say a trial judge is watching this. What should they do? What is this process like? Well, it, it depends on where you're a trial judge, what level of court you're on. Uh, so if you are already a federally appointed judge, and so you're sitting on the Superior Court of Justice as, as I was, uh, then you've already gone through the, uh, uh, if I can call, call it this, the appointment process. You've been vetted by the committee and, and so on. Uh, and um, as a result of that, you don't have to go back through that whole process because you are federally appointed already and you can you can just uh, put in a, a statement of interest or put it put in any any manner of form that you, that you wish to you uh, but you've gone through the process whereas, uh, if you're outside of the federal appointment process, then you need to uh, apply because it will go through the regular application uh, process and there'd be a committee vetting and so on. Um, I'd, I'd like to jump back to your career now. I promised in the beginning that I'm going to return to this. You had what I would say uh, was a meteoric rise after law school. You worked for the Crown as a Crown lawyer, then you uh, went to Stockwoods, became a partner, then very quickly you became a trial judge, and then you were appointed to the Court of Appeal. You earlier mentioned that you spent a couple of decades uh, in the Crown office. Can you talk a little bit about the Crown work? But I want to know specifically about the years when you came up against the heavy hitters, uh, those truly high-profile, excellent, exceptional defense lawyers. We all know that you had a very heavy burden of proof to discharge as Crown Counsel. What was it like? Can you talk about that? Can you talk about those big cases and what was it like facing all these uh, elite, uh, incredible defense lawyers? <laughs> okay, sure. So, for, I mean, the first thing I'd say is I, I don't think I had a me meteoric rise uh, at all. I, I mean, I, I was Crown Counsel in the, in the Crown Law Office Criminal, and after a certain period of time, I became General Counsel, uh, remaining in that office. But I, um, 
I did all manner of work uh, there. I largely did indictable criminal appeals in this court, in the Court of Appeal and in the Supreme Court of Canada. But I, I was always firmly of the view uh, that you have to uh, do trial work uh, as well, or for, at least for me, I really felt I needed to have a command of a trial court as well, so uh, that I felt more confidence on my feet when I was making submissions as an appellate lawyer. To me, this was really important to 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 understand the process at an able to do level. So I could speak about the process and advance submissions, uh, knowing the context for it and, and how it all worked. So I, I was in and out from time to time. I even took a secondment uh, for a year uh, or more at, at one point um, to go work just in a trial office. And I did trials um, from time to time in, in, in different jurisdictions. Uh, to make sure that I, I kept my fingers in and I kept fresh on the, the trial front. So so I thought it made me a, a better appellate lawyer. I, I'd like to think it, it helped me along the way a bit. So um, I, I, I guess I came up against um, who would have been, you know, the, the really leading defense counsel back in those days, either, you know, at trials or or on appeals, um, and what was it? What was it like? I mean, it was always great. Quite frankly, uh, you know, it's. <laughs> I'm a huge advocate of civility. Um, I always like to get along with everybody I was doing a case with. You could you can go into a courtroom and uh, and be advocating on opposite sides of the courtroom, but at the end of the day, I always like to be able to sit down and or at the beginning of the day and have a coffee with whoever those counsel were or whatever you, you might do, grab a bite after the fact, uh, congratulate each other on a job well done and, and see where things ended up at the, at the end of the day. But um, I stood in awe often of, of the incredible advocacy on the other side of the courtroom. And I, I really think uh, one of the best uh, things that a, a lawyer can keep in their toolkit um, from an advocacy perspective and to make them a really good advocate is to never make it personal. It's just so important uh, to just never delve into the personal because it's not personal. You're not your client. <laughs> Um, your client isn't you. You've got a job to do um, and to really respect the individual lanes of each player in the administration of justice. I mean, justice works best when everybody is actually in their own lane and not judging each other, but just advancing whatever uh, their mandate is in the courtroom. And so I can say when I was up against all, you know, many of these giant giants, I was like standing in awe often of the incredible uh, job they were doing. There. But um, I, I would like to think we did justice in, in, in those, uh, in all of those cases. And, uh, you know, it, it just never became personal, personal for me. If it became personal, it was because I genuinely liked the lawyers on the other side of the courtroom. What was it like being general counsel of the Ministry of Attorney General? Is it like being a GC of a large corporation? Are you protecting the interests of the ministry or are you protecting the interests of the public? What does this role entail? General counsel uh, in the, the criminal law division, which is where I worked uh, in the ministry of the attorney general, uh, is uh, a designation given to, um, it's population controlled basically, and it's a designation given when you've achieved, you know, a certain level of uh awesome. uh you know i i'm not sure what the right word senior is. seniority maybe not really seniority sometimes people get it when they're fairly young sometimes they get it at the last stages of their career um but usually it's it's meant to signify that you are making a broader uh contribution to the work of of the attorney general so in the criminal law divisions uh case 
what that really means is uh, that it's a reflection of the fact that you're not just kind of uh, within the silos of your individual cases, uh, but you're helping the division at large. So in my case, it may well have been a reflection of the fact that I had certain uh, far reaching roles as Crown Counsel. Um, by way of example, I uh, I ran the uh, electronic surveillance uh, unit for the, not just the Crown Office Criminal, but the Criminal Law Division. So I was responsible for delivering the education to Crown agents uh, year by year, figuring out who would be designated under part six of the Criminal Code, uh, handled the wiretap reports for the uh, Attorney General that have to be published every year, I did complex uh, search work. I sat on major case management teams and so on, those, those kinds of things. So it's a reflection of this, I think this broader, wider contribution when people are designated general counsel. Yeah. You've had so many leadership roles over the years and you've, you had grown as a leader, uh, but did any of that prepare you for what happened in the world in 2020? <laughs> and I'm, I'm talking about the pandemic and uh, I'm talking about everybody working from home and uh, courts uh, switching to Zoom and switching to remote. But as far as I know, you continue to show up in the office in uh, e even in the early days. Talk about that, please. Well, I did. I, I continued to come in for the most part, um, as did a, a number of, of, of people, you know, when it was safe to do so. And uh, only only then, you know, in masked and following all of the guidelines uh, necessary and required. But I, it, you know, was I prepared? I mean, were you prepared for the pandemic? <laughs> I don't think anybody was prepared for the pandemic. I'm I mean, still not prepared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, nobody was. It just, uh, it just arrived, and I think everyone's life was really turned on its head. So, I mean, but I think we all rose to the occasion. I am incredibly proud of uh, how justice responded during the the pandemic how justice in ontario and canada responded how we were able to continue uh to deliver justice at every level of court uh how the chief justices and the associate chief justices across canada and all of the judges across canada all of the staff working in the courts all of the lawyers um we collaborated, and I think that's what it was all about. Um, we at the Court of Appeal are keenly aware of the fact that we, in part, made it through, I think, uh, the pandemic, I'd say quite successfully. We, we, as we've already touched on, Pulat, we, we don't have a backlog in this court, but we are deeply indebted uh not only to those who work in this building at osgood hall and i mean we are deeply <laughs> indebted to them uh but we're deeply indebted to the bar we um very early on in the pandemic realized we needed to uh collaborate with the bar we needed to get direction from the bar we needed to understand the needs of the bar uh and to respond to those needs and so I um I liaised uh largely the Chief Justice and I split uh pretty much on this. I liaised largely with the the criminal bar. Uh and we put together an incredibly talented uh group of of lawyers and organizations that were able to assist us and and guide us and collaborate with us in terms of the delivery of uh criminal justice through this court. And Chief Justice Strathy did that on the non-criminal side, so with the civil bar and equally with uh, organizations and lawyers who gave so much of their time to allow us to develop practice directions, redevelop practice directions, develop new bail protocols with an eye to and compass trained on liberty interests and making sure we were responding as effectively as we possibly could to, the, to those challenges. Um, and I think through that collaboration, uh, we we actually uh, did actually quite uh, quite, quite well. Um, so you know, leadership through the pandemic, um, 
I think uh, everybody everybody showed leadership through the pandemic. Yeah, and the, if that includes the bar. Thank you. I think you were called to the bar. You became a lawyer in 1992, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's right. So you've had a chance to observe this profession and uh, the judiciary over a long span of time. Right. And I'm sure a lot has changed since 1992. Oh. I um, I wasn't even in North America in 1992. <laughs> so uh, a lot of people talk about what changed for the better. I'm really curious, in, in all this time, do you think something's changed for the worse? And do you want to talk about that so we can learn from that? Oh, something that's changed for the worse. You know, I, I, I like to look at stuff like uh, from, from the better perspective. <laughs> I find it easier to talk that way. Um, and, and you're right, Hulat, a lot has changed for the better. Um, there's no question about it. I, I think that uh, the, the justice system is, is strong and healthy and, and, and responding uh, and evolving. And I think we're, 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 doing, uh, we're doing really good work. And when I say we, I mean every aspect of the, the justice system. What's changed for the worst? Um, I, I, I guess I'd, I'd answer it through uh, the lens of, you know, what are the challenges today? What are the biggest challenges? And I'd say well, one of them is just, uh, you know, the, the, the sheer weight of, of the workload, the complexities in, in the law. I think the law is a lot more complex today than it was when I was called to the bar. Um, and uh, trials are a lot longer today. Jury charges, you know, are a lot longer today than they were at one point. And I, I think a lot of this is a reflection of, you know, the evolving complexity of the law. Uh, and I think that, you know, that places some some weight on the system. I think that uh, we we have an eye to Jordan ceilings, especially on criminal law. We've got to get through cases in a in a certain amount of time. And uh, I think that's a real challenge on the criminal side. And and it's that ever you know present balancing of that against the 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 civil cases and the need to move those cases along uh and you know i th i think these are weighty issues they're resource complex issues uh and they're ones that we're going to need to i think turn our mind to i think in part one of the good things that came out of the pandemic is that we've I think we we uh, moved probably decades forward overnight in terms of the use of technology in the justice system. I can tell you uh, without one bit of exaggeration, um, what used to happen in this court until March of 2020 is you, know, you would literally have boxes of materials arrive in your office uh, ahead of a sitting week to start to prep for that sitting week. And that just, we basically have no materials arrive anymore. Sometimes we get a paper compendium. Uh, that's about it. It's all electronic. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a very important development. I think that we need to improve on this, though. And we need to continue to think about technology and the use of technology uh, to, to make for a more efficient justice system. Because... Uh, we can't continue with the this archaic record keeping. It's just uh, the 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 crushing weight of it is not uh, something that I th I think the that that we can uphold um, for for the rest of time. So we we've got to figure out how to moving out of the pandemic now continue down this path that that we're on of technology. You know, when you mentioned technology and uh, when you said how boxes of materials disappeared from your office, and I can see it, your office is empty of boxes right now, but uh, it, I couldn't help thinking then that, that things have really changed for, for the better and that they, they are a lot better now uh, if you just think about the technological change, because even I, having practiced only for 12 years, remember the uh, mass 
of materials. But do you think that there is nothing in the past that is is, is valuable for us in the past of, of our profession? Do you think our profession has a short memory? And especially now because of technology and that we are arrogant with technology. We think that uh, the past uh, can teach us nothing. We don't remember the lawyers of the past. We don't remember the judges of the past. We don't remember the cases of the past. We're obsessed with the latest precedent. Do you think uh, I'm uh, reasonable here or do you think I'm being too harsh on us? Uh, I don't think you're being too harsh, never. Um, but uh, I'm not so sure I... I I think we we forget all of that. Um, just look at this discussion that we've had. You, you know, just 20 minutes ago, we were speaking about the great Mark Rosenberg, <laughs> um, who is, you know, um, one of the the greats of all time in terms of uh, both a litigator and a, a judge in Canada. And look how long the memory of that is. Did you ever meet uh, the Honorable Mark Rosenberg Poulat? No, unfortunately, I never had the honor. But look, you know him, you, you know his name. And that's because he is part of the legacy, the great legacy of um, the legal fabric of, of Canada. Uh, and I think that you can look back and think about so many uh, lawyers and, and judges uh, who hold that great honor and I think who carved a path of uh, strength, a, a very, you know, formidable, um, uh, very formidable litigators, very formidable judges and jurists who carved these paths of exactly who we are in the justice system in, in, in Canada and, and what we're about. So, you know, whether it's the, the G. Arthur Martin, <laughs> room here in the Court of Appeal where we preside uh, behind, when we preside in courtroom 10, we step into the G. Arthur Martin room. Uh, and that's where we conference our cases. And uh, in the back halls here, and, you know, maybe, um, uh, you know, some will, will will hopefully see it see it one day. Um, it's beautiful the the names of of judges carved in the the wall in, in the wood appearing there because there's a rich history and I think that's really important to remember that the law is always evolving in Canada that it it comes uh, from somewhere and it comes from the hard work of lawyers uh, and it comes from the hard work of of judges. Um, and uh, it evolves over time, but it's all there. It's all part of our rich history. Associate Chief, it was true pleasure interviewing you, and I want to thank you for your time, for your wisdom, for your insight, for your generosity, and I want to wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pulat, and uh, have a happy holiday. I hope thank you're going to you. take some time off. Thank you so much. Thank you.